Welcome to Cambridge Forum, where we will be discussing the Tea Party with political scientist Theda Scotchpole and her co-author Vanessa Williamson. Their forthcoming book, The Tea Party and the Remaking of Republican Conservatism, will be serving as the basis of our discussion. I'm Alex Kesar with the Harvard Kennedy School, and I am the moderator for this session. As we all know, after a potentially demoralizing 2008 uh, Republican defeat, uh, conservative activists were able to acquire new energy and a new identity through the emergence of the Tea Party, uh, a organization which has gotten a remarkable amount of, of, of attention uh, and apparently energy. Its appearance also raises a host of questions. Among them, one might ask, what are the sources of the group's influence? I mean, one could ask, is it a group or multiple groups? Is it a proto-political party or entirely a movement within the Republican Party? What impact is it having on policy debates today? And then more speculatively, perhaps, how is it likely to affect the 2012 election cycle? To address these questions, uh, first, we will have comments from Theda Scotchpole, who is the Victor S. Thomas Professor of Government and Sociology at Harvard University. Her research focuses on US social policy and civic engagement in American democracy. She has recently launched new projects on the development of US higher education and on the transformations of US federal policy in the Obama era. Among her great many academic honors, she was awarded in 2007 the Johann Skeit Prize in Political Science, the largest and most prestigious prize in the field. She has published a dozen books and is quite simply one of the most influential political scientists of our time. Vanessa Williamson uh, is at an earlier stage in her career. Uh, she is a PhD student in social policy, pursuing her PhD in political science and social policy at Harvard. Her research interests include the political support for and effects of welfare and entitlement programs. Before coming to Harvard, she served at, uh, as a policy director for Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. And among other distinctions, she once briefly worked as my research assistant. Um, well, welcome to Cambridge Forum, Theda Scotchpole and Vanessa, uh, and, and Vanessa Williamson. And really with this, I would just like to turn uh, the podium over to, to Theda. Thank you, Alex. It's a great pleasure to be back at the Cambridge Forum uh, after quite a few years, this time to talk about a very timely topic, the Tea Party and the remaking of Republican conservatism. Uh, as we all know, looking back over the last few eventful years, Tea Party protests first burst on the scene in early 2009 starting just weeks into the historic presidency of Barack Obama. On February 19th, uh, 2009, MSNBC commentator Rick Santelli uh, went into a tirade on the tube um, against government rewarding bad behavior by helping people in trouble with their mortgages. He invoked the founding fathers, no less, to denounce Obama administration efforts to help what he, people he called losers and called upon America's capitalists and loyalists to stage a Tea Party. Now, this rubric inspired and gave sudden hope to grassroots conservatives and organizers, local and national, who until that time had been demoralized and angry at the advent of a Democratic president and Democrats in control of both houses of Congress. As we know, in the ensuing weeks, demonstrations featuring older white people dressed in colonial garb and carrying handmade angry signs broke out at various places around the country and recurred over the coming months. Uh, they were spurred on, celebrated, advertised, promoted by Fox News and the conservative uh, media echo chamber. Um, and by late 2012 resulted in a massive demonstration on the mall in Washington, D.C., and effervescence and organization leading into the 2011 election year. 
Tea Partiers played an apparent role in the surprise victory of Scott Brown in the special Senate election in Massachusetts in January of 2011, and Tea Partiers played various roles in the victory of conservative Republicans in primaries throughout uh, 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 2010, uh, excuse me, it's 2010. Now, in the 2010 election, um, large numbers of Republicans were returned to the Congress of the United States, particularly the House, and into state houses across the land, uh, including uh, Republicans further to the right than any who, that have been seen in many years in a party that was already very conservative. And those extremely conservative people were identified with the Tea Party in many cases. Since the 2010 election, um, Washington, D.C. has been preoccupied with issues that have been pushed by Tea Party activists and organizers, namely cutting federal spending and regulations, slashing them in, 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 in major ways. And uh, it looks as if we know that um, Republican office holders and candidates are in many ways catering their messages uh, to Tea Party uh, activists. In fact, just the other day we saw the remarkable uh, um, spectacle of CNN teaming up with a far-right Republican political action committee, the Tea Party Express, to sponsor a debate, a Tea Party debate, among Republican candidates for president in 2012. So what has happened here? Uh, who are the Tea Party protesters? Are they truly grassroots? How have uh, a minority, by any way of counting, and a minority that has, by all measures, become increasingly unpopular with large numbers, with most Americans in recent months, how have they gained such leverage over one of our two major parties, the Republican Party, and such influence on national agendas of public debate um, uh, in, in a time of economic uh, and social crisis? Well, Vanessa Williams and I were fascinated by these questions from very early in the Tea Party phenomenon, and so we teamed up to use an unusual combination of methods of, of gathering evidence to try to understand, to triangulate on the Tea Party and understand its impact. We did in-depth interviews um, and uh, field observations in Massachusetts, part of Maine, Virginia, and Arizona. We looked at polls and surveys across the, the months in 2009, 2010, 2011, not just to try to identify who Tea Partiers and their sympathizers were, but also to track American attitudes to the Tea Party. We have used public records about the Republican Party and national organizations that have jumped into the Tea Party uh, bandwagon. Uh, we uh, worked with two Harvard undergraduates to do a survey of 800 to 1,000 local groups that had a presence on the web last, as of last spring. And we also tracked trends of media coverage, especially in Fox News and CNN. All that is uh, in the book about to appear. But I'm gonna hit a few of the highlights of what we discovered uh, and give you an idea you know, where we come down on some of the debates about the Tea Party. There are those who say the Tea Party is a purely grassroots uprising, and there are others who say it's a manufactured, top-down, astroturf uh, phenomenon. Uh, we don't agree with either camp because, among other things, we are very clear that the Tea Party is not one thing. It is not one organization, and it's not even one network. It is a confluence of three strands of political effort that bounce off each other and magnify each other's impact and give the Tea Party as a whole a lot of impact on the Republican Party and through it on national debates. There are genuine grassroots activists and sympathizers that I'll talk about shortly. That's force number one. There are elite, professionally run advocacy groups funded by what we call roving billionaires, ultra free right uh, rich people who are trying to get rid of most government in the United States and certainly not to pay for it. 
And there are conservative media cheerleaders who have also played a role as part of the movement as well as reporting on it. So let me talk about these three strands and how they come together. Let's start with grassroots activists. They're Tea Party activists, people who uh, do things like attend protests, carry signs, um, contact legislators in the name of the Tea Party, or attend local meetings of Tea Party groups, the 800 to 1,000 local Tea Party groups, are certainly a minority of Americans. By the broadest definition of people who sort of sit on their couch and say they sympathize with the Tea Party, maybe 25 to 30 percent at one point, with, and that's waning now. Uh, but, of course, in any phenomenon like this, the true activists, the people who get off the couch and do things, are a tiny minority. And we estimate that there have been two to 300,000 people who have actually played an important role in forming and attending local Tea Party meetings, and probably uh, uh, about that number again are a few more who maybe occasionally drop in on a spectacular protest. Tea Partiers are, and this we learned in both our observations in our interviews and by using national sample surveys that are more uh, objective, uh, we learned that Tea Partiers are older, white people, overwhelmingly white, almost all over 45 and mostly over 55. Uh, when I attended a Tea Party meeting, I fit right in. Um, <laughs> And uh, they are people who have always held very conservative views. Early on, there was some supposition that they might be middle of the roaders, but these are people who have either voted for Republicans regularly in the past or are to the right of Republicans. They're libertarians or people who are disgruntled with Republicans but would certainly vote for them over any Democrat available. Uh, often, they are economically comfortable. They're not rich at the grassroots. They're middle class people and they often have a pretty good education. So the idea that these, these are a bunch of uneducated uh, people is not, that is around out there in some circles is simply not true. About half of Tea Party activists and identifiers are also religiously inspired conservatives, uh, but there are also libertarians who take a more secular outlook and think more in free market terms. Tea Partiers, and this becomes clear when you talk to them face to face as well as from surveys and obs observations, fear and hate Barack Obama. And they were very upset when Democrats won power across the board in 2008. Uh, the economic crisis that was unfolding at that time certainly caused anxiety, especially among older people with mortgages and lifetimes of savings, uh, but these were not the Americans hardest hit by the economic crisis. So this is not, this is more of a political reaction than an economic one. Tea Partiers wanted to find a way to fight against Obama and his policies without just passively supporting the Republican Party as it was uh, under Karl Rove and George W. Bush. Do Tea Partiers hate government? We hear all the time that they simply want to get rid of government, cut spending, eliminate regulations. Uh, Vanessa and I were a little skeptical because we thought, well, if they're over 55, they're probably mostly collecting Medicare, Social Security, Veterans Benefits, or about to. And indeed, they are. Um, so when you get beyond the survey questions and you sit down with people face to face, as we did, it turns out that Tea Partiers are not against everything government does. Most of them believe in Social Security and Medicare, think they are legitimate programs that go to hardworking Americans who've paid taxes all their lives and earned the benefits they are collecting. They are very supportive of generosity toward military veterans, and some of them are retired military people, especially in Virginia. What they're against is public spending on people they think of as freeloaders who have not earned their way. And, you know, we wanted to hear who the freeloaders were, so we listened carefully. And the freeloaders are illegal immigrants who Tea Partiers everywhere believe to be arriving en masse to take taxpayer-supported services. Uh, they are lower-income people who Tea Partiers think don't pay taxes. That's not true, but that's what they think. And they are young people sometimes giving examples from among their own grandchildren. 
and grandnieces and nephews who are seen as wanting something for nothing and not behaving as responsibly as the older generation did because they're unable to get into the labor market and form families in the same way that their grandparents did. So, and when it comes to regulations, briefly, Tea Partiers are uniformly against regulation of business. There simply is no uh, idea that they are against big business. That's not true. But they are perfectly happy to crack down on illegal immigrants in the most draconian ways. And those of them who are social conservatives are also anxious to use public law to drive abortion providers out of operation and make sure that gay people are not treated equally to others. Um, these are old, long-standing conservative themes. And they have been recrystallized for a new time, a time when the country is experiencing change through immigration, when young people, as one of our, our informants put us, the young people are all Obama, Obama, Obama. And when Obama, with a foreign father, a black skin, and an Ivy League pedigree, <laughs> said he wanted to change America, Tea Partiers reacted with fear and anger, and their movement is a hope to turn that back. But the Tea Party is not just a matter of grassroots protests, organizing, voting, and activism. The Tea Party is also something that long-standing, well-funded, professionally run lobbying, advocacy, and political action committees have sought to leverage and use to push goals for remaking the Republican Party that they have had for a long time. Freedom Works, for example, is run by Dick Armey, a former Republican Speaker of the House and a business lobbyist. It helped to launch Tea Party Patriots, an umbrella group that tries to orchestrate local tea parties. Lo local tea parties are not actually easy to orchestrate. They're pretty persnickety. So it's a loose relationship. Americans for Prosperity is funded by the Koch brothers and pushes uh, elimination of Social Security and Medicare, removal of regulations, particularly environmental regulations, and uh, uh, lower taxes on the fabulously wealthy. And of course, they are the fabulously wealthy. Tea Party Express, which just was presented as a grassroots group on CNN, is a relabeled piece of a long-standing conservative Republican political action committee run out of California, which channels money into Republican primaries and general elections on behalf of far-right candidates. These groups, lobbyists, professional ideologues, and ultra-right billionaires and millionaires, want a Republican party candidates and elected officials who will not compromise with Democrats when in office and who will move quickly to pass laws, busting unions, reducing taxes on the rich, and dismantling major social programs. These groups immediately tried to form email and encouraging relationships with grassroots activists. They use grassroots activists as a backdrop for their efforts but they don't directly control the grassroots activists, and the grassroots activists certainly do not directly control them. Uh, you may have noticed that grassroots activists mainly believe in Social Security and Medicare, and the elite advocacy groups in and around the Tea Party are trying to dismantle those programs. The final part of the picture is the conservative media, of which Fox News, we found our Tea Partiers told us they watched it mostly entirely, for six hours or more a day in some cases. Um, they listen to conservative radio, they do blogging, and even though they are grandmothers and grandfathers for the first part, they have become very, very good at using the internet uh, to track legislators and express their views and get the word around. Uh, so the conservative media uh, headed by Fox News, but not only Fox News, played a very important role in the early stages in giving people a sense that there was a Tea Party, that it was a big deal, telling them where they could go to join protests, and ultimately giving local organizers some pointers on how to organize local groups, although we found that local organizers who often met each other for the first time at protests took the initiative very much as volunteers. They are not simply creatures of uh, uh, elite groups or media. 
Now, let me wrap this up by saying that after 2010, November 2010, in some ways, the dynamic among the three parts I've just described shifted. In the period leading into the 2010 election, the mainstream media as well as the conservative media were riveted by the old white people with the angry signs and the colonial costumes. So we saw them all the time. Even as most Americans were becoming more wary of them, they looked as if they were a big deal. And they were an important part of an electorate in November 2010 that was 40% of voters only skewed toward the older, whiter, richer people from which Tea Partiers came. But after 2010, national media wanted spokespeople for the Tea Party. They didn't, we don't see the grassroots protesters so often. Grassroots protests are not really as well attended and the local groups are perking along but they're not as attractive to the media. So the national media go out and find people like Dick Army and dub him the leader of a grassroots insurgency, <laughs> even though he couldn't be more Washington, or take spokespeople from these wealthy advocacy groups and suggest that their priorities, like removing Social Security, are priorities of the Tea Party as a whole. The bottom line, though, is that the Tea Party in its insurgent phase and in its more, uh, shall we say, elite hijacked phase, uh, has pushed the Republican Party very far to the right because Republican, because Tea Party identifiers and sympathizers are about half of the GOP base and they are the more active and intentive part of the base. They are tracking what candidates and elected office holders are doing. Um, uh, Republican politicians are very frightened of what the grassroots voters might do in low turnout primaries, and they are even more worried about what the elite funders might do to, to bankroll a challenge against them if they cooperate with Barack Obama and the Democratic Party. That means that a minority movement becoming increasingly unpopular has had a great deal of leverage over the national agenda through Republican control of the House, Republican control in many key states, and through uh, the, the fact that media are crowning many of the national advocacy spokespeople uh, to ask them questions about what the Tea Party wants. Going forward, it's possible that some of the tensions between grassroots Tea Party attitudes toward things like Social Security and Medicare and elite Tea Party preferences to destroy these programs may play out in the competition between Romney and Perry in the uh, GOP uh, uh, competition for the presidency, although we didn't find a single Tea Party who, who told us that they liked or trusted Mitt Romney. Uh, because they don't think he stands for anything consistent. Uh, when, which, you know, you could see why they might think that. Um, <laughs> probably what they like in uh, Rick Perry and in some of the other candidates is not just the specifics of their policies, but their take nor prisoners tough guy attitude, because this is a grassroots phenomenon that very much wants to kick Democrats out of office. It is possible that when we get finally to the general election, which will be many months from now, uh, Tea Party, a Tea Party influenced and shaped Republican Party will suffer somewhat at the hands of middle of the road voters, non-Tea Party Republicans, and independent uh, voters. But this is all playing out in an economic crisis in which Americans are frustrated and confused and angry about uh, what's happening and about whether government can or is doing anything they want done about it. And that includes frustration with Barack Obama and the Democratic Party. So it is very possible that in January of 2013, Americans will be saying they don't like the Tea Party in large majority. They will be rejecting the policy ideas of Tea Party advocates and ideologues by a large majority, but Republicans will control both houses of Congress and the presidency, and at that point will come under great pressure to simply put through many of the radical changes 
that have been pressed by Tea Party elites uh, in this period of popular protest and effervescence. So let me stop there and turn it over for discussion and questions. <laughs> Thank you, Theda. That was, that, was, that was a terrific uh, introduction to this. Uh, you are joining us at Cambridge Forum, listening to Theda Scotchpool and Vanessa Williamson discussing their forthcoming book, The Tea Party and the Remaking of Republican Conservatism. And then what I gather is a tradition of Cambridge Forum, and if not, I'm about to start it, I get to ask the first question. Uh, um, and it's really, I, I, I really have a, a, a two-part question, or maybe it's two questions, and I'd like to just toss these in the direction of our authors. Um, one, one and, the, and I, think that, I think these two dimensions of it are related, but you were, you were somewhat gingerly in your discussion of this, but I guess a question that looms up is how much, how much of this is about race? Um, it's, and that it does strike me to be, an, an, or it seems to be a relatively important dimension. And then another you know, perhaps related question is, as I listen to you speak and as I've watched and some bewilderment um, what's gone on over the last year and a half. I, I wonder if you could talk about the degree to which you see the Tea Party as political as opposed to cultural. And, you know, and maybe it's not a good distinction. Um, but I mean, by cultural, I mean, I, I, I'm reminded of, uh, you know, the, mo the movement for prohibition back in the 1920s, sort of, and the people sort of, the, the countryside against the city and H.L. Mencken's characterization of the advocates of, various things sort of against the city as people who deep in their heart of hearts fear that somebody somewhere might be happy. Um, but I mean, it's a different, it's a different phenomenon, but, it, but that, I, that I saw as more essentially a cultural phenomenon. So let me put these two and ask the two of you to take whatever pieces of it you would like. I'll start saying some, I, Fida, will say something about the race issue and Vanessa can uh, add her perspective on that because of course, this is something that we thought about, uh, and then we'll move on to the other one, but I think the race question is, is on people's minds. Um, the first thing I wanna say is that um, meeting face to face with actual Tea Party activists um, who were gracious to us if they agreed to meet us. Some didn't agree to meet us when they looked me up on the internet. Uh, but others uh, knew that uh, or suspected that we were not Tea Party patriots, uh, but that our politics is different, and nevertheless sat down and talked with us face to face in a very human way. It's an important thing to do because face to face with people who are playing an active role in organizing and leading local groups, you realize that most of them are acutely aware of the racism charge, are trying to avoid it, are willing to speak up in a meeting if somebody else says something that is not appropriate. Uh, and uh, most of the people we met were not firebrands. I mean, I think they probably said some pretty severe things off the cuff, you know, even in the meetings and in their signs, but they weren't, uh, they knew who we were, so I suppose they were trying. But um, they told us life stories that involved uh, personal relationships with people of other races, including one woman who raised a foster child who was black. So it's not a simple matter of global racism. That said, two more things to say. Uh, conservatives, ultra-conservatives in this country have had a hard time accepting the legitimacy of democratic presidents. I think it's fair to say that. When Bill Clinton, who is white, a white Southern good old boy, really, was elected president, he was pilloried, attacked, and unremittingly gone after uh, by the right. They used the material at hand, which was morality. And there was material at hand. <laughs> uh, with Barack Obama, those who are deliberate about going after him as a Democratic president, trying to stymie his and destroy his presidency and make sure he's not reelected are using the material at hand. 
And I think elites and media people are quite self-consciously wielding racial fears and stereotypes. You just have to listen to Fox News for a while. They're all over the place. Uh, and some of the grassroots people that we spoke to also casually used language that obviously had racial illusions and reverberations when they talked about welfare, for example. Uh, but, and this is the big but, their resentments and fears of illegal immigration are just as great, and so the fact that Obama has a foreign father is probably just as important. Their resentment of liberal Ivy League professors who are believed to be scheming and manipulating to control regular Americans are profound. And the fact that he was a constitutional law professor and went to Harvard Law School is a point against him as well. Uh, so I, he's the perfect storm. And young people like him too, which makes, which I think brings me to the comment I'd like to make to the other point. We see this as about, as a generational reaction based on fear of a changing society and determination not to pay taxes to support the people who are rising in that change. So it is about what they say it's about. I don't want to, we're not second guessing the folks, but there's also an obvious fear, uh, a, a edge of generational fear and fear of social and cultural change. Thanks, uh, Theda. Vanessa, would you like to add that? Yeah, I would actually. Um, I think what Theda said is exactly right. Again and again, we would see people say they were very aware that they had been called racist, right? And this was a question that came up again and again. People would go out of their way to ask us long before we brought up anything about race. Um, to say, you know, I know that you think we're a bunch of racist rednecks, was a phrase we heard a couple of times. Um, and so they wanted to tell us that they wanted to invite black speakers, you know, especially conservative Christian black speakers, to come to their groups, and they wanted to find ways to sort of diversify. Um, and so that's absolutely true. But at the same time, you would also see these very long-standing American stereotypes. So, you know, I mean, and there have been surveys done to sort of get at this a little more. Um, people in the Tea Party are more likely to think that minorities are lazy or not hardworking or taking advantage of the system. So sort of really long-standing and, and really quite unattractive, ugly stereotypes um, are something that are sort of in the back of people's minds. And, and you can tell that in interviews. But I think Theta is exactly right to take this beyond just thinking about black and white. And not only are they really concerned about immigrants, they're also very concerned about um, Muslims, right? I mean, you know, September 11th came up quite a number of times, and they have people are very concerned about sort of a, um, you know, Sharia law and all, all kinds of ideas about, about the government being subverted by foreign forces and particularly foreign forces from the Middle East. Um, yeah, and, and that sort of blends in with this idea of sort of uh, white intellectuals who are sort of working on behalf of these minority forces, as you said. So there's sort of this, it reminded me a little bit of the idea of sort of a carpetbagger, right? That there was this sort of unity between sort of northern or eastern um, elites and minority groups that wanted something that they hadn't earned. But it's a much more, it's a more subtle thing than some sort of straightforward, you know, racist um, dynamic. And it, this is Theta again. It is true that the thing they say with the most feeling is we want our country back. We heard that in every region, those exact same words. So it's an attempt to go back to something, and it isn't 1776, not really. Um, and, uh, you know, one gentleman said to us about Obama in a quiet moment, and People didn't yell at us in these discussions. They really were very polite. He said, I just can't relate to him. And I think that was a very honest statement. And I think if we all think about it, no matter what our politics or our preferences, we were all a little bit startled that a black man named Barack Hussein Obama could be elected president of the United States in 2008. Many of us, and I was one of them, were delightedly surprised. But Tea Partiers were horrified and fearful in their surprise. This is Vanessa. I'd just like to jump in on the, that last point. I mean, that, what, a comment that came up again and again was, it was a quote from Obama about how what he wanted to do was transform America. Right, and so I think for many people in the country, this was a call to you know like great hope and all these things, right? 
And that's exactly what Tea Partiers perceive to be happening, right? That, that tr America is being transformed, but that transformation is something terrifying. Thank you. Um, once again, welcome to Cambridge Forum with authors Theda Scotchpole and Vanessa Williamson as we continue our discussion of their forthcoming book, The Tea Party and the Remaking of Republican Conservatism. In the book, the authors examine the, the emergence and influence of the Tea Party movement that arose in the aftermath of the 2008 elections. At this point in the program, we will be taking questions from the audience. So I invite members of the audience to line up at the microphone in the middle aisle to pose your questions, and I exhort you to be as succinct as possible. Um, just as Barry Goldwater in 1964 uh, brought the Republican Party so far to the right on issues that it was hard to win, just as last November, it's my belief that by that the Tea Party saved the Senate for the Democrats by nominating uh, extreme right-wing candidates like uh, Christine O'Donnell or, well, I've forgotten the names by now. Uh, but of course, uh, as the eternal optimist, uh, I would love it if you could sketch out a scenario where the Tea Party pulls the Republican Party so far to the right that they guarantee not only Obama winning, but uh, both houses of, of Congress being back in the Democratics. We that guarantee from the two of you. Give us some optimistic hope. You know, we're political scientists, and that means that we are in a profession, um, you know, where a a major presence in the prognostication business are people who crunch numbers. And the numbers they crunch always have to do with the president's rating on the economy and optimism about the future. If you believe those numbers, Barack Obama doesn't have an iceberg's chance in hell to be reelected. And you can find a lot of political scientists that will tell you. Now, I do think that there are two big roiling forces here. One is the American uh, mainstream's anger at the fact that Washington has spent all its time talking about something other than jobs and economic growth, which is what people have been saying with one voice is their priority. That anger reaches to Barack Obama and the Democratic Party as well, as to the Republican Congress, which now has a Republican-controlled Congress now has a 15% approval rating. But don't kid yourself. A lot of Americans don't even know which party controls Congress. They do know which party controls the presidency. So uh, Republican office holders have been catering to, the, to grassroots at the elite and elite Tea Party forces. But they are also following a cynical strategy to um, undermine pub public faith in Obama and cause him to lose. Uh, and that may happen. The Senate can hardly stay in Democratic hands. It will be a miracle because so many seats that Democrats control happen to be up this time. Uh, the House may well go back pretty far toward the Democrats, probably will, because the throw the rascals vote out will hurt the majority. But it would take a mountain, it's a mountain to climb to gain back enough seats, particularly given that Republicans are busy finding ways to discourage voters who would support Democrats in many states. They are redistricting many states to get rid of democratically uh, friendly seats um, and may even ch make changes in the Electoral College that will make it virtually impossible for a Democrat to win the presidency. So uh, the 2010 election can have long-term consequences even if popular uh, views and many votes turn around in 2012. This is Vanessa. I just add one thing to that. Um, I think one thing it's worth remembering is that both at the elites and the grassroots level, certainly they, it's very important that they, to them that they defeat Barack Obama, but they've shown themselves very willing to risk moderate candidates in their own party to, to primary them and risk overreach to create ideological purity. So um, a, a broad coalition that holds the majority is not necessarily the goal, I think, particularly for a, a section of the Republican Party that's, that's very willing to govern by 
um, saying no. Well, they're also looking for just a bare majority in the Senate. And so the fact that they sacrificed a couple of Senate victories last time, uh, from the point of view of elite funders in the Tea Party, is not particularly worrisome, given that they frightened people like Olympia Snow and Susan Collins in Maine, and are preventing them, and Richard Luker in Indiana, preventing them from compromising with Democrats right now. You paint a picture of people who are not really stupid, but why is it that they would really blame the Democrats when everything was caused by a Republican administration? Why are they so unable to, to deal with what the actual facts are? Where does this fear of Democrats come from when the Republicans put us in the mess? All right, it's Theta, and then I'm sure Vanessa will want to add some things. Um, the grassroots Tea Party people we talked with and the elite uh, Tea Party manipulators that we didn't talk with are not necessarily enamored of everything uh, Republicans have done, especially um, expanding federal expenditures, catering to social, social welfare needs through the Medicare prescription drug. They're pretty sour about some of that in many cases. But it's important to realize that they hate Democrats more. Uh, and so there's no way at all. I mean, the Democratic Party was spoken of in our presence uh, as a coalition of uh, government employees living off the taxpayer, welfare and illegal immigrants trying to freeload off the American taxpayer, and politicians and elite intellectuals who are enabling them. That's the Democratic Party in the view of these folks. And they don't want to compromise with evil as they see it. Now, I do want to say one more thing. We were impressed by the savvy and the organizational commitment of the grassroots Tea Partiers we met. They were exemplary American citizens in the sense that without pay, men and women were putting in many hours to organize meetings, uh, to make refreshments to be sold, just like at a church supper, uh, to collect money, just like we are tonight here in a basket, to run carpools, to take people to demonstrations, and to sit in front of their computer screen for hours tracking the precise doings of local, state, and national officials. As political scientists, we were really impressed. They knew the numbers of the bills. They knew exactly which committee they were passing through and exactly when to intervene. So we were faced with the contradiction that the liberals we meet with in Cambridge know the details of tax policy, know exactly what's in and not in the health care bill. The Tea Partiers we talked to were completely factually ungrounded, to put it politely about these matters. They believed there were death panels in the, in the health bill, attacks on all real estate transactions in the health bill, um, that environmental laws are a conspiracy to impose socialism on America through bike paths. I mean, really fantastic, unfactual things, if I can put it politely, about the content of policy. But Cambridge liberals think you can just write to the president and tell him to give a speech, and that gets things done in legislation. These folks knew better than that, and they're very committed and very organized about what they're doing. Uh, so there it is. I, I have very little to add to that, but I will say one thing I did notice sort of on that last point is that um, often I think you hear discussions of, of what Barack Obama should do. Right. I mean, I think many, many of us have probably been in a discussion where we talked about what Barack Obama should be doing. And the people in the Tea Party spend almost none of their time discussing what Republican leadership should do. And they spend all their time talking about what their local Republican committee should do and how they're going to make them do it. Uh, so there's a, a really sharp-eyed focus on local activism that I, I was very impressed by. And which pays off. Hi, I'm not an economist. I'm an artist. Uh, and if I didn't live out of the country a good deal of the year, I guess I wouldn't be surprised at the political correctness, the mockery of the Tea Party, the overview of 
they're being hypocritical. They take Medicare, don't they? They don't know the bills. They are just negative toward Obama. Um, I can't find a Tea Party meeting. I want to go and see what's going on personally. But I am an anarchist, and I am, uh, having lived abroad in a socialist country, found that oh, you haven't discussed the details of what the serious considerations and oppositions of Obama's policy, the trillions in debt, for example, the fact they don't want deficits. You talked about racism. You talked about how silly and trivial and kind of unknowing these people are. Um, I would have liked to hear more about, like me, the secular libertarians, um, the serious care about the Constitution and the freedoms that we have, that more every day I learn that people don't elsewhere in so many other countries. Um, it was a superficial playing over the top, and I guess if I spent more time in Cambridge, I would have expected that. But if you could speak seriously about what's going on, um, and that's what I thought you would, they claimed that you were a great political scientist, then I would have uh, been grateful. Thank you for your question. Um, I'd like to point out that you are the one who used the word hypocritical. You will not find, that, no, you will, I said some say they are hypocritical. That is not our view. And you will not find a disrespectful characterization of Tea Party people or their views in our book or in the remarks tonight. I did not say that they were trivial. I said that they are active citizens who are having a major impact. I said that some of their views are not factually grounded. And at length, at another occasion, I would be happy to defend that view. Now, you ask about the concerns about the deficit and about the Constitution. Those are important themes in Tea Party discussions at the grassroots as well as national level. And we heard some of that in our interviews and in the meetings, we attended meetings to observe and listen to what people were saying. There is a lot of discussion of the Constitution. In many ways, the Constitution is used as a sort of biblical text. It is quoted from at the start of meetings it is handed out, pocket constitutions are handed out as gifts. Uh, Vanessa was given a pocket constitution to thank her for her interest in the Tea Party. And I observed a Tea Party leader in uh, New Hampshire hand to a Maine Tea Party leader a, a pocket constitution autographed by Michelle Bachman as a way of showing, um, um, giving her something that would be delightful to the group. Um, Tea Party people tend to be more in favor of some parts of the Constitution than others. Um, they say they don't want to change anything and they don't want politicians to do anything that isn't reflected in the original text, but they also would prefer to get ready, rid of many of the amendments uh, to the Constitution. Um, and they have their interpretive differences about what it means just as everybody else does. As for the deficit, I think it is a very important symbol to Tea Party people and to many other Americans for that matter of the fact that government may be spending a lot and running up a lot of debt without necessarily doing what people mainly want it to do. But I said that Tea Party people support the major things the federal government spends money on. Those things clear, are social even security. Even sometimes subtle. And I think that no, I'm, I'm very secular, so mocking their religiosity doesn't impress I me. I didn't mock their religiosity. You do. I'm a Methodist. Well, <laughs> give me a break. I did not. Well, you I'm are, an atheist, and I would defend that. You are reading into me what you oh, believe God. about liberal you Harvard professors. I am it's not called. simply a liberal Harvard stuff. professor. Mm -hmm. I come from the Midwest, I watch football, and I'm a Methodist. <laughs> I had no trouble relating to Tea Party people. So just don't make things up. I'm just an Let artist. Let me answer I your question. by political correctness. I will sit down. Sit down. 
we ask people partway through our interviews, is there anything you like about what the federal government does? People smiled and said, I didn't see that one coming. They had a sense of humor about it. They gave us concrete examples like they loved the national parks. One woman liked the fact that Medicaid pays for disabled children like her foster child. And they all approve of social, all but one, approve of Social Security, Medicare, and veterans benefits and defense spending, which are the major things the federal government spends its money on. So on a perhaps somewhat different note, um, could you talk perhaps a bit more about how the Tea Party, both on the grassroots and elite level, see themselves in relationship to sort of mainstream Republicans? Do they see themselves as part of the mainstream, as a new Republican party, so forth? Sure. Um, well, I think that there was, for quite some time, uh, a fair amount of talk about them as a separate political party that sort of made the rounds. It was actually very interesting. I, I looked a little bit into um, where that idea originated from. It actually originated from a, a couple of conservative pollsters who uh, placed survey questions that asked people uh, very early on in the Tea Party phenomenon, back in 2009, um, would they want to vote for a Democrat, a Republican, or a Tea Party candidate? And this is back when 40 or 50% of Americans had never heard of the Tea Party and would say so in a, in a survey. Um, and so that's where you sort of see the, the beginning of this idea of them as a third party. Um, and I think it was, a, it was a popular idea in the media and it never really had any traction on the ground. The people that we meet at Tea Party meetings are conservative Republicans. And their problems with the Republican Party are typically that they are not conservative enough, whether from a, a, a libertarian perspective or from a social conservative perspective. But in both cases, uh, they stand in stark opposition to the Democratic Party. Yeah, this is the, they're very pragmatic about that. I mean, I, I found quite a lot of understanding among people we talked with that they would just be dividing their forces to, uh, to run a Tea Party candidate apart from Republicans. So this is very much a formation over the right edge of the Republican Party, trying to shape it and move it to the right. It's not, and, and let's distinguish between liking the Republican organizational establishment which these folks don't, and they don't trust it, uh, and voting for Republican candidates in competition with Democrats. By the latter measure, they are Republicans. First of all, forget the suit. I'm here basically in defense of what you have to say. I'm talking about Theta. I absolutely support your position on the Tea Party. But let me assure you, the Tea Party is only a propaganda apparatus of the Republican Party. The real danger that this country is going to go down on is the pharmaceutical industries. They're taking people over the hills. As a matter of fact, there was a book just written uh, by a fellow by the name of Falloon, and it's called uh, Pharmocracy. And it tells about the dirty deals that's being carried on behind closed doors. And this is a fact by the FDA. And they are the biggest troublemakers in this country. I, I know I'm on uh, pharmaceuticals myself being a hot patient, but my, my question to you, briefly, is what is the progressive wing in this room and certainly in the country doing about this? How are they reacting? How are they uh, basically organizing in order to counterattack the, the evil, really, that's opposed oppose the people in this country? Well, thank you for your question. I think it's fair to say that Vanessa and I are here tonight, and, and as authors of the book, we're trying to be scholars, yeah. understanding um, uh, an important force yeah. uh, in all of its complexity. Um, we are certainly not here to speak for the progressive part of the Democratic Party, I mean, I'm wherever it is. 
Um, so um, I don't think I want to try to answer that question because I don't think I'm the right person to do it or this is the right occasion. Your comment about the pharmaceutical industry, I mean, I think it's fair to say, and here I do speak as a political scientist and as one who's written a book about health care reform called Health Care Reform in American Politics, What Everyone Needs to Know, which clearly explains what's in the Affordable Care Act, how it came about, and where it's going. Um, I think it's fair to say that all the dominant industries in the United States have got their fingers wherever they can get them into both political parties and will do what they can to shape legislation, regulation, and spending in their own interests. So that's certainly happening. I'm not sure that I would characterize the pharmaceutical industry as the chief culprits or the, because yeah. there are so many uh, culprits. Thank you. When the president last week talked to Congress and offered some specific plans for the economy, do you feel at some point in time there will be any sense of accountability if the Republicans and through the don't respond and that he's able to say, I offered something, I made suggestions, but you have not done, you've just been obstinate, you've just wanted to refuse to do anything to the election. Do you think over time that there will be any waking up to that and that Americans will say, wait a minute, we really need to rethink our opinions about the president? Well, um, here's what political scientists know. They know that it's very, very hard for the average citizen carrying on their daily life, caring for their family, trying to deal with economic pressures, which have only gotten greater for most Americans in this, in this dire period that we remain in. It's very hard for them to track exactly what's happening in uh, Washington, D.C., or with particular office holders, or even always to identify a political party with a particular outcome. Now, that's particularly true where the House of Representatives is concerned because there are hundreds of them. Now, it is true that right now the House of Representatives, Congress in general, has a 15% approval rating, which makes Barack Obama look like a popular giant by comparison. And it is also true that the proportion of Americans who are saying they don't want to reelect their representative, which is a, tr it's an indicator that political scientists track because usually people say, I hate Congress, but I like my representative, or I hate public schools, but I like my public school. But right now people are saying by substantial margins that they don't want to reelect their representative to Congress. That's why when Barack Obama gave his American job speech the other night, which represents a pivot for him, a movement toward articulating a view of the economy and trying to convince Americans that he's fighting consistently for it, maybe too late he's made this pivot, but he's made it. That's why you saw stony looks on the faces of the Republican leaders, and you did not see them come out right afterwards and say, drop dead Barack Obama. They went back and had a drink with each other and said, drop dead Barack Obama. <laughs> and they have no intention of giving him any kind of economic boost or any kind of political victory. But they were afraid to say it openly because they don't want to make visible the Republican obstructionism in Congress. So over the next year, we're going to see a very, very interesting um, a theater playing out here, and of course then there are those eight Republican, however many, really quite an array of Republican <laughs> candidates for, the, for office, the, uh, the office of the president who are also part of the game, and their interests are not exactly the same as the congressional leadership. So uh, your guess is as good as mine about what will happen, but, but you can be sure that President Obama and the Democrats will be trying to make visible uh, what they might have tried to make visible long ago, but did not succeed in making visible. Thank you very much. Hi. So you talked about a generation gap, and in, in particular about how um, the Tea Party was feeling sort of resentment towards young people, even towards their own grandchildren. And I was wondering if you could sort of talk about the rationale that they give for that. Well, look, I, I'm in my 60s, too. So it's not uncommon for older people to sort of say, you know, it was better in my day. 
and those youngsters, you know, they're, they're just not working as hard as I did, or uh, where are their morals, or what are they thinking? So I want to say that I think we need to have a little bit of just human understanding and sympathy about the way grandparent generations look out at the world. That said, um, we believe, and this is what we try to say in our book with as much care and nuance as we can, that these very conservative older people have an edge about them toward the younger generation. They use anecdotes from their families just because people use anecdotes to illustrate general points. I don't think they're particularly angry at their own relatives. I think it's that they don't quite see how hard it is in a changed economy for younger people to get jobs. For example, they think Pell Grants are like welfare. Pell Grants are grants for lower income students to go to college, and some Tea Party politicians have equated them to food stamps and welfare. And so there's the suspicion that Pell Grants, they might be taxed to pay for Pell Grants that Obama is expanding so young people can just collect a check and they might not even graduate from college. Well, it's true that they might not even graduate from college. A fair number of young people can't get by on their Pell Grants and have trouble actually getting enough credit hours to graduate. They also have trouble getting into the labor market. They may be at home living with their parents. They may not be marrying uh, and forming careers the same way that the grandparents did. And I think looking out from the experience they had in an earlier era of the economy and the society, these are conservative older people, many of them originally Goldwater supporters, who are looking at the usual generational changes through their prism, a certain kind of prism that makes young people worrisome. It also was true that young people voted for Obama in large numbers. That was the biggest gradient, the age gradient, in the last election. So uh, there's a political edge to their uh, resentments as well. And some people told us about younger relatives in their own family who were Obama supporters, and they couldn't fathom what they were thinking. Yeah, I just uh, add my own perspective on that. So um, I experienced a little bit of Tea Party issues of younger people firsthand. I'm 29, uh, and so I did not fit in terribly well at most meetings. Um, and so, <laughs> and so I, you know, and I, I found people, you know, very perhaps a little bit concerned at first, but like in their interactions with other groups about whom they have concerns in the general sense, in the individual context, people tend to be pr more open-minded, right? But I would just, I'd emphasize sort of two things about their views of young people. First of all, it's important to remember that in America, young people are more diverse than old people, right? We have a younger generation that looks different from the older generation. And so these, these sort of concerns that we've talked about are overlapping in a lot of ways. Uh, the other thing I'd say is that for the Tea Partiers who are social conservatives, and that in our experience is not just the majority, but also the most active members, um, uh, their views of young people's sort of social mores played into a lot of this concern too. So there's the economic concern, but there's also the uh, sort of views of how people are building families that are just not in line with uh, their sort of traditional views. Ernie Frank say that he thought he could um, join forces with the Tea Party in cutting defense spending. But what I'm hearing from you is that that's not likely to happen. This is Theta. The one issue where some, and I want to underline the word some, of the Tea Partiers we talked to might have a convergence with people on the left was in suspicion of spending for the Afghanistan war. Uh, and willingness to cut the defense budget. Um, that is not a universal view inside the Tea Party. The Tea Party has diversity on its views about foreign policy and defense policy. It has internal diversity, obviously, in this divide between secular libertarians and religious conservatives. They work very hard in their meetings to bridge those differences and to build a common stance on the things they agree about. Uh, Barney is probably mostly dreaming on that. Um, <laughs> but it's true that in straight out votes on defense spending, especially as long as it's not a Republican president but Obama uh, who's there, there might be some Tea Partiers and some progressive Democrats that would vote the same way, and I believe that's already happened. 
Hi. Um, the Tea Party has gotten a lot of play at a number of levels for um, being more open to women and women politicians. Um, and you, you'll see Michelle Bachman and Sarah Palin trotted out, you know, it's um, symbols of this. But also there have been a lot of articles about how women are sort of more empowered in politics at the grassroots through the Tea Party. And I was just wondering whether you could speak a little bit to sort of gender issues uh, and the gender contours of this movement. Uh, absolutely. Um, so I think that in person, I mean, much like what you saw, we tended to see women in real positions of power. They tended to run local meetings. Um, they were often sort of women who had experience, you know, in the PTA or running other sort of groups that sort of came to the fore. A lot of, um, typically the leaders we met, if they weren't uh, retirees, they were younger stay-at-home moms who might have a little more free time in the middle of the day to sort of organize a group. Uh, and we saw that on several occasions. So I think that it, it's definitely true that um, women, you know, there are certainly the very prominent women associated with the Tea Party, but that's also what we saw on the ground. And I think um, certainly from Theta's research on sort of the history of, of um, these kinds of groups in America, that's, that's not uncommon. Right. Women always do the grassroots organizing in my experience. but. Um, you know, we were pressed, actually, by some interpreters in an earlier article we did on this to talk about sexism, male sexism in the Tea Party, because the national surveys show that Tea Party supporters, sympathizers, the question varies, uh, it's a loose question, tend to be about 55% male to 45% female. But we didn't uh, agree to go along with that because we tend to think that maybe the men are the couch potatoes of the movement. Uh, the activists were often these very, very energetic women who in their late 40s were often the youngest person in the room. Uh, I attended a meeting in Virginia, for example, that was in the back room of a restaurant. Uh, the meeting, we always observed whether the meeting started with a prayer, whether the prayer mentioned Jesus. Uh, it always starts with the Pledge of Allegiance, which everybody stands for, including us. Um, it, um, that meeting started only with a pledge. It was in a relatively secular area of Virginia, university town, Charlottesville. And the leader was an energetic woman who had organized volunteer theater productions and knew how to get lots of teams of people together. She's an extremely admirable and energetic woman. No question about it, a stay-at-home mom. And well, who was never at home. Um, much like Phyllis Shafley traveled the world to tell women to stay at home. I mean, conservative women are often the, the real spark plugs, and this is true in the Tea Party as well, at the grassroots, definitely. Given that, that you're poli political scientist, is that the right term? Um, science is about, in some ways, prediction. Presuming that. Uh, Perry gets in as president and they control the houses. They essentially seem to want to dictate what happens. What happens to the democracy that was founded on the Enlightenment when we have such conservatives that want to go back to essentially an aristocracy? What happens to the government that uh, I think as uh, Franklin said, uh, we have a democracy if we can keep it? What happens? What do you, what do you see with, in that kind of worst case scenario? Well, I'm not gonna characterize it that way, but I will say, all right, it's interesting to think if Rick Perry, with a lot of Tea Party support in the Republican primaries, becomes the GOP candidate, wins the presidency, likely with a, with a Senate that has a slight Republican majority, and likely with a House that has at least a slight Republican majority, there will be a lot of pressure, not just from the grassroots, but from these highly active elite groups that I want to call your attention to because they are very important in all of this. They deploy funds and they deploy ideas. Uh, there will be a lot of pressure on that kind of newly elected Republican government to take radical steps very quickly. Much as we've seen in some of the Republican sweeps in the Midwestern states, or even in Maine, where I spend my summers, where a man elected with only 38% of the vote has rammed through some pretty, uh, you know, you might say gratuitously uh, upsetting uh, to other people things. 
Now, our observation of Tea Party people is that they don't believe in compromise. And they don't accept the idea that legislators that they consider to be their representatives, and they think they are, much as radical small d democratic movements throughout history have always thought, they think of representatives as being on a very short leash, as they're supposed to do what they want. And they don't b believe that they should sit down and compromise much the way Congress has always worked in the past. Um, now, that's not what most Americans really want, in, uh, if we believe of surveys. I'm not making a political statement here. And it is also not the way the government can work. It just doesn't work that way. Um, I do think that there may be some very radical changes very suddenly if Republicans control everything and if the president is Rick Perry. If it's Mitt Romney, he will find ways to fudge. <laughs> uh, he certainly will. Uh, I'm shocked. shocked. <laughs> <laughs> that. Hi. Um, since you're a political scientist and historians, uh, early on when the Tea Party was coming out, there was a lot of comparisons between the nativists, know-nothings, and the Tea Party. Uh, is there really that sort of a, is there that strong nativist movement inside the Tea Party? And were the sort of parallels drawn from the 18, 1850s, 1860s to current uh, political situation? The anecdote about our Massachusetts survey. Oh, yeah. Both of my reps were know nothings at the time, so. <laughs> well, we're not talking about the know nothings, but Tea Party years now. We did a survey, or to be specific, Vanessa and colleagues did a survey of Massachusetts Tea Party activists, which the leader of the Massachusetts Tea Party agreed to send out by email. And at the last minute, you know, we had a list of issues, or she had a list of issues that they might say were important. And this was very early in the Tea Party movement. And so I suggested that we add immigration because I'd actually been walking through an antique mall and hearing a couple Tea Partiers talking, and they were so upset about immigration. And it struck me, why would they be? In Massachusetts, it's not Arizona, you know? I mean, and this was before the Arizona thing. So we put it on the list. And in Massachusetts, before the Arizona issue became, uh, the issue of how to treat illegals became a big national fuss, um, that came out as number two right after government spending. So I think it's fair to say that concern about the impact of immigration, which is heavily of uh, brown-skinned people from Mexico and Latin America in this era, is very high on the list of Tea Party concerns across the entire country. If I, if I can interject here, since I'm actually also a historian, is that there, there is certainly um, at the time of the Know Nothings, there was a "We Want Our Country Back" theme, very much theme, you know, for the Know Nothings. I mean, it was a re it was a reaction in in this state, among other places, right? I mean, we briefly uh, passed a law saying that uh, you had to wait 21 years after you were naturalized as a citizen in order to be vote in order to vote, because that's what babies had to do. Um, yeah, and that theme is a, was important in the 1920s. I mean, it just recurs. 1850s, 1890s, 1920s. It's again here, uh, and I think it is also tied to some of the efforts to say that people are illegally voting. Um, I think we probably have time for these two, two last questions. Um, for me, this was so great. I, I don't meet Tea Party people around Cambridge, so it was so helpful to have you bring so much nuance to it. I feel like I learned a lot of things. I wonder, um, I know, I'm struck that everywhere I travel in New England and outside New England, I am able to pick up right-wing talk radio on AM radio, in particular Rush Limbaugh, but lots of other shows too. And I just, I, I heard something that startled me, which was that that's a major, quote, news outlet in places where there are overseas military bases. Anyway, I just wondered if you wanted to comment on the role of right-wing talk radio. Thanks. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to talk about that a little bit. Um, in addition to Fox News, uh, over and over again, we heard that people were listening to right-wing talk radio. And you've got to remember that there's overlap between the two, that many people on Fox News also have a radio program. So um, people sort of have personalities that they follow in both, in both contexts. 
Uh, and those are major sources of information. Uh, one thing that's important to remember that I believe the average age of a Rush Limbaugh listener is 72 years old. That's the average, right? So um, they're hitting the same sort of very much older demographic that you end up seeing in the Tea Party. Uh, in terms of, you happen to mention military bases, it's important to remember that um, the military skews young and skews diverse, so it's really quite a different community in that way. Um, this is Theda, that was Vanessa. Um, the meeting that I attended in Virginia, uh, most Tea Party meetings have a uh, speaker who comes in. And in fact, one of the ways in which the advocacy groups get their ideas out is by providing free speakers for the monthly meetings. And the organizers don't have any money, and they need to have a show each month for the folks to come. The meeting that I attended happened to be half devoted to talking about what should we do now that we've won the 2010 election. So it was a fascinating and very participatory meeting for me to attend. But halfway through, the speaker for the evening arrived, and he was the local right-wing talk radio jock. And if you read accounts of the early organization of Tea Party protests, and if you read uh, uh, or observe meetings, uh, local right-wing talk radio people are not only um, celebrities that people listen to, they are often part of the organizing infrastructure. And they echo the themes that come up on Fox and vice versa. And of course, there are blogs then that spread um, elaborations of those themes. So that the same phrases get repeated over and over again. And that evening, um, Joe Thomas of the Charlottesville uh, right wing talk talk radio uh, told the mostly elderly audience that he hoped the federal government would shut down in a debt crisis because nobody would miss it. <laughs> and not a single person in the room batted an eye at that. So uh, the Tea Party. Uh, people do not like uh, so-called illegal aliens. Uh, do they also dislike uh, so-called legal aliens or, or the immigrants? They already mentioned that um, you know they don't like Muslims. They don't like uh, you know some of the people from perhaps from Mexico. But uh, how about their attitude toward Europeans and Asians who generally come uh, in illegally? And second question is uh, they don't. Uh, one characteristic. Uh, of Tea Party uh, uh, members, uh, they don't compromise. Where does that come from? Is that related to their religious righteousness? And is this the, I don't know that I, this, uh, the, where does that really come from? Two separate questions? Yeah. You want to take the first? I'll take the first one. So this is Vanessa. Um, on the question of how Tea Partyers feel about legal immigration, it's a point that they make a big distinction about. Um, you know, they, they often will be in the middle of talking, mid-phrase talking about immigrants, and then pause and say illegal immigrants, because they want to make that distinction quite clear. Um, another thing I n noticed was that often in these discussions, people would sort of subscribe to ideas about America as a, you know, as a melting pot. They would talk about their own heritage, you know, my family came here from Ireland, that sort of a story. Um, and I think those things are, are very real and very important for people. But I, again, I think that when brought into the specific about their own family or about a single immigrant, there tends to be a lot of empathy between people. And the, these were generally very you know, open people, very friendly. Um, but then when sort of taking a step back and looking sort of generally at the country, I think some of those, those dis fine distinctions get fuzzier. Well, or this is Theta, I would say crueler. I mean, I was struck by the fact that when talking about specific people, including immigrants who might even be illegals, um, who were gardeners or who were housekeepers, um, uh, the Tea Party uh, people we talked with in depth were just as sensitive and decent in their discussion of the, and appreciative of the good qualities of those people as anybody would be. Uh, just as they were polite to us, very invariably polite to us in personal exchanges. Um, you know, I think it depended on the fact that we treated them with respect, too. Uh, so we, we wouldn't play to any stereotypes they might have about haughty Harvard professors uh, and, and, and graduate students. But 
when they speak about broad categories of immigrants, they tend to see them as illegal more often than not. They tend to speak of them almost in cruel ways. The cruelty and the rejection is greatest about Muslims, and there were no people who talked to us about personal encounters. This is just a small sample that we're dealing with. Uh, and um, just as uh, they speak about Democrats or liberals with extreme uh, a stereotype, and I sat through a discussion of public school teachers that was just cruel uh, about people making small amounts of money, just dismissing them because they might be unionized, um, and speaking about them and demonizing them. So I think there's that disconnect there, which, by the way, a lot of us are prone to. I think when we talk about other categories that we have no interaction with, we often speak in stereotypes. Uh, but this is a little more so. And let me say something about the compromise issue. I don't know where that comes from. I think there are various academics grinding away on social psychological theories. We don't do that ourselves, and in a way, I don't really want to. I found it uh, disturbing to think about anything that would um, deny the autonomy and the citizen equality of the people I was talking to. And so I don't really want to know whether they all have authoritarian personalities or something. I think it's more likely that people were very angered at the arrival of solid Democrats, much the way many liberals in Cambridge were upset when solid Republicans arrived in 2000 and wanted to push back unremittingly against things they think are very wrong and this is the other part of it, things they fear. The emotional tone of fear is overwhelming. And when people are afraid, they get pretty rigid, in my experience. I think we have, these will be the last two questions, and perhaps if each of you could make it fairly brief, that yes. we're getting to the end of our allotted time. Yes, uh, my name is Safi Anwar from Indonesia. You know, frankly speaking, and very, very uh, thank you for your very enlightening uh, presentation. And you know, uh, frankly, I am uh, fans of President Barack Obama, uh, not only because uh, he was uh, ever living in Indonesia, but of course because of his ideas perspective. My question to you is that, you know, I am a bit afraid, afraid with uh, the, the Tea Party, uh, especially related to the future of American democracy. But my question to you, to you is that whether Tea Party is strongly influenced by you know, religious, religious fundamentalism, if yes, what kind of religious fundamentalism that, fundamentalism that you know, uh, influenced Tea Party, if yes? I'm not sure I understood your question, say it again. You know, you know, whether Tea Party is influenced by religious fundamentalism, oh, yeah. and what kind of religious fundamentalism that you know, influenced Tea Party, if yes, thank you. Uh, Theta, about half of them are, according to national surveys, and sometimes the more outspoken half in the meetings we attended are evangelical Protestant Christians, and uh, who who are feel strongly about uh, abolishing abortion, and preventing uh, gay marriage, and other social issues of that kind. Um, I think their influence in the Tea Party meetings has been growing because they have uh, joined as it has become a, an important uh, phenomenon. But the Tea Party uh, people are not united in those views. Uh, and they do a lot of work, which we describe in our book with lots of stories, to sort of paper over the differences. Uh, now our final question. Um, you said that the, um, uh, the activists in the Tea Party were, were mainly from middle class and educated people, and uh, when you look at the discourse of those people, it's mostly the same kind of discourse we find in Europe in extreme right parties, uh, for instance in France in the National Front, and it's mainly a working class party and a working class electorate. So I was wondering, if, how do you explain that difference between middle class and working class electorates in those two different Theta, it's partly the differences in the way we use these words in Europe and America to describe some of the same people. But I would say that 
And, but based on survey evidence and what we saw in, our, in our, both our surveys and our interviews, um, we're talking about, often we're talking about retirees from white collar jobs. Many are from the small business sector and have a small business person's view of the world. That's very important. Some come from military occupations, have been in the military, have been career military. Um, so this is not exactly what I as a social scientist would call wage earning working class. I'm not saying there are no wage earning working class people who come to Tea Party meetings, there certainly are, but the center of gravity is that kind of white collar small business world uh, and the private sector except for the military. Thank you, Athena Scotchpole, and thank you, Vanessa Williamson, for a very enlightening and judicious discussion of a subject where judiciousness has not always been the hallmark um, of all discussion. I think everybody here is looking forward to, to reading and certainly at least purchasing your book. Uh, um, if you purchase it, you won't be able to put it down. No. <laughs> it's got lots of stories. <laughs> You, you have been listening to a program of Cambridge Forum recorded in September 2011, co-sponsored by the First Parish in Cambridge, Unitarian Universalist, the Lowell Institute, and the Friends of Cambridge Forum. For a CD of this forum entitled The Tea Party, or for additional information about our ongoing radio series and our forum network webcasts, visit us on the web at cambridgeforum.org. In Harvard Square, I'm Alex Kesar. Thank you for joining us.